Hello, everybody. I hope you've had a happy 4th of July weekend. Uh, I, uh, by the time you see this, our four class sessions on F. Scott Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby and the Jazz Age will have ended. I wanted to let you know I enjoyed it very much, and I hope you did too. I sort of was thinking a little bit about the fact that we emphasize the cultural so much and putting so much emphasis on Fitzgerald's connection to the times, to various social movements, to the Harlem Renaissance even, that uh, we may have overlooked a little bit some of the more biographical background that you wanted. So I thought I'd just make up a little short um, video with some illustrations to give you a little background. If you don't want to watch this, I'm not going to, my feelings will not be hurt. But if you do want to watch it, hopefully it'll give you a little more sense of why he was drawn to particular types of themes or how the book itself came to be put together. So very quickly, I'm going to share my screen and make sure I can find the right window. There we go. All right. So our special edition, we're going to call it the Great Gatsby Cluster, because what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about a sequence of stories that he wrote that led up to the Great Gatsby. These were, in a sense, tryouts that he made uh, in developing uh, certain themes and motifs that show up in Gatsby again. And what inspired this was again, the, the list that Jade gave us in our second session. So I thought I'd start with just a little quote, very famous quote, they're a rotten crowd. Nick Carraway shouts across the lawn to his neighbor, Jay Gatsby, you're worth the whole damn bunch put together. This is the last time he sees Gatsby. I've always been glad I said that. It was the only compliment I ever gave him because I disapproved of him from beginning to end. One of the neat things about Gatsby is uh, Nick Carraway is alternately a, uh, attracted and repulsed to Gatsby's ostentatiousness and what he stands for. First, Gatsby nodded politely, then his face broke into that radiant and understanding smile as if we'd been in ecstatic cahoots on that fact all the time. And again, there's that smile. Remember in our first session, we talked about how many smiles there were, um, how many times Nick comments on Jay Gatsby's smiles. So the last time they see each other, there's that one as well. All right. Let's start with the biographical background. This is a young woman named Ginevra King, who is F. Scott Fitzgerald's, probably would fair to say, first serious girlfriend, long about 1915, 1916. She was from Lake Forest, Illinois, as you can see in 1918. She made the cover of Town and Country magazine. She was part of what Chicago called the Big Four, a group of debutantes from the Midwest who were famous for their beauty. Later in life, Fitzgerald would write a series of short stories uh, in which he came back to Ginevra King and wrote a, uh, called uh, Joseph, the Josephine Stories. They pair up with a series of ones that he wrote about his own childhood called Basil. So the stories are called the Basil and Josephine Stories. Um, but Ginevra King was the inspiration for Daisy Buchanan. We should say right off the bat that Zelda is only partially a inspiration. She gave Daisy some of her best lines, including the one that came uh, supposedly when da Daisy is giving birth to her daughter. I hope she's a beautiful little fool. That came from Zelda. But by and large, Daisy Buchanan's social background comes from Ginevra King. Interestingly enough, Ginevra King was good friends with Edith Cummings, who we said last week, the world-class golfer who partially inspired Jordan Bacon, Baker, the golfer. And we also noted that perhaps Jordan, there is some speculation that she may have been passing, although the question I left is with is, not whether there's enough evidence to make that convincing, but why do we want it to be convincing? 
So Fitzgerald and Ginever King dated for basically two years. Um, they had a lot of fun together. That should be uh, 1889, excuse me, on the PowerPoint. Not That'd be quite a feat if she were born 1989 to 1980. Sorry about that. But um, she was in prep school while he was in Princeton. They ran around together a lot. Uh, but in the summer of 1916, Fitzgerald visited her family in Lake Forest, Illinois. And now it's not clear whether it was her father, Charles King, or whether it was uh, an adult relative. It's not clear whether he said this to Fitzgerald specifically or whether he overheard it. But there's a famous line that says, poor boys shouldn't think of marrying rich girls. And that ladies and gentlemen, is the insult that started a career. If you ever wonder why Fitzgerald was so obsessed with class and so obsessed with the rich, it has partly to do with the fact that he was born to a family that was fallen socioeconomically. Uh, his father could not keep a job, um, but also because of this particular snub. He was never quite good enough to be in the rich crowd. Now, one of the neat things, there's a good book on this subject, by the way, called The Perfect Hour by a mentor of mine named James L.W. West III. You can check it out. Tells you everything you need to know about their relationship. Also gives you some sort of stories that Ginevra King wrote, which are pretty interesting. But maybe even more interesting is the fact that online you can go up and you go and look at what is F. Scott Fitzgerald's ledger, which is the book that he kept um, throughout his adult life, in which he kind of goes back over all the big events of everything. There you see on that top line, there is the infamous petting party, and there is a party for Ginevra. But down here below, we have the line, poor boys shouldn't think of marrying rich girls. That's right there in his diary, if you want to call it that. Doesn't say who said it, but it's very clearly there. And that is, in a nutshell, the story of Jay Gatsby. So Fitzgerald felt that snub uh, intensely. And over and over again, he would write the story of a middle-class, aspiring, middle-class young man trying to make it uh, socially by gaining wealth, by gaining prestige, by gaining acceptance into the world of the wealthy in order to prove himself. And it all boils down to that 1960 snub. Um, the first story we see this in is one called Winter Dreams from 1922, a late, uh, late 1922, beautiful story. It was written in the wake of Ginevra King's marriage and again in his ledger, he went in there and wrote, it's the end of a poignant story under a clipping of the announcement. That's Ginevra King's home in Lake Forest, Illinois, been redone a few times, obviously, but it gives you a sense of the wealth of the family and the estate there. Um, but this is the cover of Metropolitan Magazine that features Winter Dreams. And you almost get a sense how now, this is kind of what's interesting is if you go back to that picture of uh, Ginevra King on Town and Country, they kind of look alike, but the illustrator did not have um, Ginevra King in mind. It's just a fluke. In the story itself, she's portrayed more as a sort of light haired or a blonde. But this is what a typical illustration out of a 1922 magazine would look like. This is a beautiful story. It's set in St. Paul, Minnesota, right out of Saint, outside of St. Paul in an area called White Bear Lake. He calls it Black Bear. Um, and it's a story about a young man who is a caddy at this golf course. And it's almost like if you've ever seen the movie Caddyshack, it's not that stupid. It doesn't have a Rodney Dangerfield character. But it has that same sort of uh, snobs versus the slobs sort of appeal, if you remember the tagline of Caddyshack. But uh, basically, Dexter Green is a young man who works as a caddy, quits his job because he's tired of being treated like a flunky for the rich, 
uh, and uh, eventually meets, uh, meets a, a woman named Judy Jones, who's the daughter of Mr. Mortimer Jones, who's one of the wealthiest man, men in this area. They have a little bit of a romance, Judy and Dexter, not Mortimer and Dexter. That would be a different story. But um, at the end of the day, uh, she goes off and gets engaged to a member of her own class. Now, where have we heard that plot before? And years later, after Dexter Green makes his money and sells out his share of a very profitable laundry business, not exactly glamorous, but it makes him wealthy. He goes into the war, he comes back, and he's on business in Detroit. And he hears from somebody that Judy Jones's marriage is awful, that the man cheats on her, that she's unhappy, that she's lost her beauty, her glittering quality. Now, it can seem kind of sexist because in a lot of these stories, it's over for young women once they get married. They're no, they're no longer quite the appealing debutantes they once were. But I think what Fitzgerald... Um, is dramatizing is less really about Judy Jones than Dexter Green's illusions in his youth. And so the story ends with a really beautiful passage. Uh, it says the dream was gone, something he had been taken from him. In a sort of panic, he pushed the palms of his hands into his eyes, tried to bring up a picture of the waters lapping on Sherry Island and the moonlit veranda, and the gingham of the golf links, all of these things associated with that particular time. Her damp mouth to his kisses, and her eyes plaintive with melancholy, and her freshness like new fine linen in the morning. We do not write like that anymore. We don't go, the, uh, we don't indulge in this kind of romanticism as much, but uh, these things were no longer in the world. They had existed, and they existed no longer. So Dexter Green does kind of what Jay Gatsby doesn't do, is he accepts that you can't repeat the past. But this is a very important, um, Fitzgerald called this story a sort of tryout for Gatsby, in which he is dealing with this theme of a cross-class romance and the hope of being better for it. Imagine if Gatsby went to war, heard Daisy had been married and then heard she was miserable, but didn't try to win her back. That's essentially what we have with Winter Dreams. Great story. It's online. You can find it. Just Google Winter Dreams, Project Gutenberg. There's a free copy of it for you to look at. The next one that he tried out some of these ideas we've already talked about. This is Jade. This is straight out of Jade's PowerPoint, by the way. So we have this beautiful uh, cover of Hearst International. Very hard to find, I should say. This magazine is almost impossible to find in this day and age. So I was glad she shared these visual, visuals. We have a scene inside now. In this case, uh, the young lady's name is Amanthus Powell, or excuse me, Amanthus. Uh, and the young man's name is Jim Powell. He leaves from Tarleton, Alabama, which is where supposedly a fictional version of where I'm at, Montgomery, Alabama, and goes up to the Hamptons and opens this sort of weird uh, school to teach young people how to uh, dance and jazz music to appreciate. It's a farcical story, but there are elements in here that show up later in Gatsby. Most famously, there's the line, you're all better of them put together, Jim, is what Amanthus tells him. And that shows up in that quote that I read you where Nick says to Gatsby. There's also a moment uh, where Fitzgerald very facetiously says in the beginning, if this were a motion picture, this is how I would make this particular movie start. And it talks about the house. Um, and that's done again when we, the first glimpse we see of, uh, of Tom and Daisy's house in East Egg. Um, there's also this class conflict and down at the bottom, um, Jim is told at one point, um, can't you see you're just a servant? They'd no more think of drinking with you here than they would uh, or accepting you in this crowd than they would their bootlegger. So 
Uh, you have a young man who is on the outside who's trying to accomplish what we're told in America we should be able to do, and yet he's not accepted by the old money. Again, I mentioned last week, I think this is maybe something we've lost. I don't think new wealth really cares that much about old money anymore. But this was a very powerful theme all the way from the 19th on up through really as recently as the 1980s. Then we come to a story that is not about a romance. It's a story called Absolution. It's set in St. Paul. I wish I could show you beautiful illustrations of this story, but it appeared in a magazine that had no illustrations. This was a magazine called the American Mercury that H.L. Mencken and George Jean Nathan started once they sold out their interest in um, the Smart Set, which was another magazine that Fitzgerald published in, but also Black Mac Mask Magazine, which was a uh, one of the first detective, hard-boiled detective magazines in this period. Um, and one of the things you can do when you read this story is you can think of Fitzgerald as a young man, beautiful young man, very handsome, but also um, a head full of illusions, a head full of the ideas that he was better than the situation in which he was born into. Again, Fitzgerald's family, his father came from a prestigious Maryland family, but his father was a failed businessman. He had a furniture factory that went bust. He was a Procter and Gamble salesman for a while, got fired one day when Fitzgerald was not even 10 years old and did not work from then on. The family lived off a very small amount of his mother's inheritance from a wholesale grocery firm that that uh, her father built. Um, so when you see Fitzgerald writing stories about young men who make their money off of things like laundromats, that's new money that's not glamorous in the way that inherited wealth is. Uh, now in this particular story, it's about the relationship between a priest and a young man. It doesn't go anywhere where we would expect that story to go today maybe. But um, it was originally written as what Fitzgerald thought would be the preface to his, um, to his third novel, as he was trying to get rolling on it in late 1923, early 1924. Uh, it was supposed to be, there is a young boy in the story who is supposed to be James Gatz as a child, and he goes to the priest and denies that he's ever committed sins. But really, what he's doing is he's fantasizing about a more romantic life. And he has this whole other identity in mind. Now, he gives it kind of a far-fetched name, Blatchford Sarnemington. Um, that's, you know, sounds pretty facetious, I guess. But you could think of a romance novel of the 1910s having a name like that. Um, but he chants this name to himself as a way of sort of fantasizing about the life that he would have. Now, you can think of Jay Gatsby building his self-improvement plan, uh, and this is in 1906. Uh, we see it, we actually get the chart laid in The Great Gatsby. That's, in a sense, what Rudolph, um, the, the uh, character here, is doing, and um, the line that I think jumps out for people is uh, there was something ineffably gorgeous somewhere that had nothing to do with God. Now, that can seem a controversial line, but the idea is, again, of ambition, of dreams. And for this young man who the proto James Gatz, before he changes his name to James Gatsby, it's the idea that he is full of these self-invention fantasies, that he's not going to be uh, limited to the world that he was uh, born into. So Fitzgerald wrote it. He thought it would be the, thought it would be the uh, prologue to the novel, but then realized it gave too much of the mystery of James Gat J. Gatsby away. So instead, he tweaked it here and there, renamed elements of it, 
and published it as a story. And it's considered one of his best short stories. It's a good, it's, one of the reasons it's a good story is it doesn't feel repetitive, a lot of these romance stories. Then there was another one that he wrote in 1924. Now, this was maybe right as he was getting to, ready to leave the United States to write The Great Gatsby starting in May and June 1924. So it was published a little bit later. Interestingly enough, it was published in a magazine called Liberty, which looked like this. This was their first year of publication. It was a weekly as well. It was a little more, little racy, a little more, a little racier, excuse me, than uh, the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, I give you this issue because it's not the, the, the issue that this particular story appears in. I can't find a cover image of it online, but I also like the title Bobbed Heads and Boneheads, which sounds like an interesting story to look up. Never heard of Elsie Janis, but that story uh, sounds interesting and that, that cover looks pretty good too. So Liberty Magazine, it was actually started by the Chicago Tribune Company. And uh, its editor was one of the rare female editors of the day of a major magazine. Had a long uh, history, went all the way up into, not as long as the Saturday Evening Post, but it had a pretty long history, went on up into the 1950s, about 25 years. Anyway, the sensible thing, it is available in his third short story collection, All the Sad Young Men, along with Winter Dreams and Absolution. So all of these Gatsby stories are kind of clustered around 1922 to 1926. What's interesting about this story, it contains a famous line that is probably the most memed line of Fitzgerald's outside of the Great Gatsby. Uh, this is a romance uh, set in Tennessee, interestingly enough, between a Zelda-like Southern belle and a young middle-class uh, aspirational fellow named George O'Kelly, who goes off. Um, the, again, the, he, Fitzgerald was so good in coming up with names for his female characters. Uh, you know, the last one uh, I talked about was Amanthus. This one's name is Jonquil, Jonquil Carey. And they're there in Tennessee. They have a romance. Uh, she's not ready to get married. He wants to go off and make his fortune. And when they when he comes back, they reunite and they realize that the moment has passed. And it's a great story about our, uh, just a relationship that had its moments. And that's what the line means there at the end. Let it pass. April is over. April is over. There are all kinds of love in the world, but never the same love twice. Uh, again, a little different from Jay Gatsby. Jay Gatsby says you can't, you, of course you can repeat the past, but uh, George O'Kelly here accepts the fact and accepts the sorrow that you can't. Uh, PBS made a good movie of this particular short story in 1996. It is on YouTube, so I recommend that you look at it. It's one of the best adaptations short adaptations that captures the mood of this particular piece. All of these stories are fairly sad short stories. Um, Bryce, uh, brass, uh, brass, uh, excuse me, dice, brass knuckles and guitar is farcical, but it ends on a very somber note. Uh, but winter dreams and sensible thing are pretty sad all the way through. Then we get to stories that he wrote immediately after Gatsby. The Rich Boy. You might think of The Rich Boy as the Tom Buchanan story. This is a two-part long story that he wrote. It's a little racier. Uh, Fitzgerald had to publish it in, interestingly enough, a magazine called Red Book. This is the Red Book that later became the women's magazine, but at this time it was a general fiction magazine. Two words, The Red Book magazine. And uh, it's one of his best stories. It's called The Rich Boy. It's kind of a psychological analysis of what wealth does to someone emotionally, or maybe what we in the middle class would like to think wealth does to somebody who's born into wealth emotionally. This is a story about Anson Hunter, who just doesn't connect 
Uh, he has relationships. He's a very successful business and a man. But the whole idea of investing his emotions in one particular person, one particular woman, just doesn't cut it for him. Now, this story is famous because it opens with a Nick Carraway like narrator who's not named in the story, but he has one of the most famous lines in Fitzgerald. He says, let me tell you about the rich. They're different from you and me. Uh, that line would later get used against him by Hemingway. Uh, in the snows of Kilimanjaro, but in the context of the Red Book, uh, in the Red in the Rich Boy, it's a great line. So you can again think this, think of this as kind of a psychological analysis of of the disconnection, the emotional disconnection. You can see Anson Hunter's just size in this illustration that somebody, uh, a um, a uh, European artist, did for a Spanish adaptation graphic novel based on this story. Uh, there's also a great line where the narrator is kind of, it's almost like he's hes not from Nick Garraway's class, but he has that same sort of uh, sense that he's on the outside. That was my always my experience as a poor boy in a rich town, a poor boy in a rich man's a rich boy's school, a poor man in a rich man's club at Princeton. That's pretty much Fitzgerald talking straight at us there. I've never able to begin to forgive the rich for being rich, and it's colored my entire life and works. That's Fitzgerald talking right there. Uh, now, interestingly enough, for a story about a charismatic man who cannot make connections and has sort of serial relationships with a couple of different women, one of whom, like Judy Jones, ends up in a miserably unhappy marriage. Well, actually, excuse me, she ends up in a happy marriage, but she dies suddenly. And that's what blows him away at the end is that he lost out and he feels bad for the fact that she has passed away suddenly. Um, but for a story that's supposed to be about a charismatic, rich Tom Buchanan type, it's interesting that this is the guy that inspired the story, Ludlow Fowler, not exactly Robert Redford, not even uh, any of the guys that portrayed Tom Buchanan in the movies. I want to mention that Anson Hunter is not, a, not as racist, not as cruel uh, as Tom Buchanan, but he is aloof. And that seems to be what Fitzgerald is trying to analyze there. Does his wealth insulate him emotionally from making those connections to other people? All right. One final story, again, published uh, six months after Gatsby, written on the heels of Gatsby. It's a Saturday Evening Post story called Presumption. This is the cover of it. And the one thing I would point out is we're in the period of time where F. Scott Fitzgerald's name would be one of the lead um, authors cited on the cover as a way of selling this particular issue. Now, what's interesting about this particular time period is this is right in the era where the Broadway version of, of The Great Gatsby is debuting and becoming a real big hit success on Broadway. Uh, it made uh, the Broadway version of Gatsby made Fitzgerald a lot more money than the uh, novel ever did. The novel sold 20,000 copies and the play ran for, I think, nine months. So it was considered a hit in its day. Changes the book quite a bit. Uh, George Wilson is Tom Buchanan's chauffeur in the play, but they had to condense quite a bit. Anyway, Presumption is another cross-class love story. It's about a young man named San Juan Chandler Interestingly enough, that name sort of suggests some sort of Hispanic presence in the story, which I don't think is necessarily borne out in it. But he is pursuing, again, a young lady who is above his, uh, above his class, and he goes off. And he, in this case, it's almost like Jay Gatsby willing himself to win this woman over. Um, she is engaged to a member of her own class, uh, and when um, San Juan Chandler makes his money, comes back to uh, basically rescue her from this um, 
from this um, um, engagement uh, that she is sort of weakly entered into. Her father tells him, you've got how presumptuous of you. That's where the title comes from and throws him out of their house. Uh, the family sends her away with an aunt and San Juan has to go and uh, track her down. Um, and um, eventually he shows up at the door of an aunt and the aunt gives him a note from this young lady that says, I never want to see him again. He's so presumptuous. And this is what you think is going to be the Gatsby type ending. Um, you can see the note there for yourself. I'll let you read that. But Juan stood there a ghost. His universe was suddenly about him. Noel, that's the young lady's name, did not care. She'd never cared. It was all a preposterous joke on him. You can see the class anxiety or the class confusion here. Played by those to whom the business of life had been such jokes from the beginning. He realized now that fundamentally they were all alike. Cousin Cora, Noel, her father, this cold, lovely woman here. They're all members of the same family. Affirming the prerogative that the rich of the rich to always marry within their caste, to erect artificial barriers and standards against those who could presume upon a summer's philandering. The scales fell from his lies and he saw his year and a half of struggle and effort, not as the progress toward, excuse me, I have to move our little thing here, toward a goal, but only as a little race he had run by himself outside with no one to beat him except his self, no one who cared. Well, you're thinking, okay, so this is Gatsby getting thrown over again. However, this is not the end of the story. The as he takes this note, San Juan takes this note, puts it in his pocket. He apologizes for intruding upon the ant and she begs his forgiveness in saying, I didn't think you'd take it this hard, Mr. Templeton. And you realize that she thinks he is the fiance. In other words, the note, this note to Aunt Jo here about the intolerable bore is directed to the Tom Buchanan character. And all of a sudden the story ends with the aunt calling Noel down the stairs saying, Mr. Chandler has come for you. Mr. Chandler has come to, to find you. So this is kind of the reverse Gatsby, if you want to think of it this way. This is Gatsby with a happy ending. What if Gatsby and Daisy had run off together? Well, probably would not have been a happy ending to that particular story because we know that Gatsby made his money um, illegally. But in San Juan Chandler's case, he made it legally legit money. And so we have a happy ending on the part of the Saturday Evening Post. So all uh, those are those are what we in the business call the Gatsby cluster, just a series of stories in which he uh, explored those particular themes of Gatsby's pursuit of Daisy and the class boundaries. And I think you can look at that paragraph there in um, Presumption, and you get about as good of a summary as you'll ever get of Fitzgerald's central theme, which is the rich will never accept those of us who were born outside of their class. Great. Well, I hope you get to go read some of those stories. They're fun. They're really interesting. Otherwise, I will just say once again, I've enjoyed this class immensely, and I uh, am happy if any of you would be interested in joining us in the Fitzgerald Society. I know a few of you have, and uh, we're very active, and we will be doing a lot more programming in the months to come. And we do have a YouTube channel, Fitzgerald's w, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald Society, where we've posted some of our programs that we've done for free online. So if I haven't totally ruined your interest in The Great Gatsby and you want to learn more, you can go there. Uh, a couple of those programs get into a lot of the race, race issues that we've talked about. All right. Well, thank you very much. And again, I have enjoyed this class immensely, and I wish you all very well for the rest of 2021. Thank you.